Okay, everybody, uh, if you're just joined, do turn on your camera so uh, Darling Ocean doesn't have to do it um, to a blank screen. And my dog has just decided that he needs attention, but um, OK. <laughs> so all right, so thank you all for coming to the first of our path talks. We are this is also a part of the exhibition that's going on right now um, at the Kennedy Museum of Art and the legacy exhibition. It closes in a month. So you've got a little bit long. Wait, wait, hang on a second. That one closes in a month. The other one closes tomorrow. Yeah. So that's coming. Um, so do be sure to see it. Uh, the virtual tour is pretty awesome. And um, I, I was really quite, I actually thought it was awesome that it's, who would have thought that we'd have such great stuff here in Athens? And it's really good. <laughs> yeah. um, there's also the really great exhibition that's been years in the making. Um, that is the work of Karen and um, Don, and that's a part of the Kennedy talk. It's um, it's important to see where we've come from so you can hear about where we're going to be going. The REACH exhibition is part of where we've come from, so it's got 23 of our alumni, and we hope that you can give it a chance to go look at it. And just yesterday, we have a pretty fabulous thing that happened in this world of disappointment. We have one small glistening thing, and it's that we re reached the goal for the Fine Arts Design Residency Trust Fund. And this is something that has been in the works, and it finally came to fruition, which is just Oh, it's really nice to hear. So what this means is that uh, we'll be able to fund different kinds of designers to come and be a part of your lives as students. So they're going to be able to do all different kinds of things. This is a quite freeing situation that we're going to be doing. So it's not necessarily just teaching class. It's actually you just being able to be with them. So uh, we you can still give through Bobcat Give. Um, and so something that I'm personally excited about, because as you can tell, I'm a collector, is that there's going to be a cyber auction of um, posters and then a ribbon cutting event for the Don and Letta type shop and bindery. So that's really wonderful. You've always already probably been in the type shop and uh, now you can call it the Atletta type shop, uh, which <laughs> gives it that extra cachet. So, uh, <laughs> right, and uh, let's see. So this is the first, um, lecture in our March series and they're all going to be from 3 to 420. So uh, just keep checking back in here on Tuesdays and uh, you'll see some pretty amazing stuff. And to start us going amazing is the awesome Ocean Island who happens to be an Athens guy. So born in Athens and that just that says so much about what kind of person he is as well. He graduated from our program in 2002 and in the past 20 years, he's had all kinds of jobs and all kinds of experience. But what we're really interested in is hearing about his life as the Associate Director of Design and Sound at PBS Kids. And he's been a, a DJ for many years. And so every once in a while, if you're lucky in your profession, in your design profession, you can connect what you love and what you do. And it looks like Ocean was able to do that, which is pretty awesome. So um, we're going to have plenty of questions at the end of this. And um, so we really want you to participate in it because this is a discussion and not just a one way street. So all right. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Ocean, and I look forward to hearing what you got to say. Hey, no worries. No worries. Can everyone see the screen? I assume I shared it properly and all that. Yes. Excellent. All right, yep. so I'm going to put this a bit on its head and that I'm really going to be looking for questions from you guys. I can give you all sorts of presentations on how I've gotten here, life cycles of projects at PBS, you know, how to build audio for video games without a budget. I can even show you my portfolio if that's the route you want to go down. But, you know, because this is a path, you know, I guess mine is the way and my way has been a bit ridiculous. Um, you can never say that it's a straight line. I've done lots of things in my lifetime to get to where I am. And so don't be afraid to take that job or to do that side hustle or to do that thing, because each one of those things will build upon itself to get you wherever you're going to go in the end. Um, yeah, <laughs> looking at that list and actually writing it up this morning gave me quite the giggle. <laughs> 
so I'm going to give you some conversation starters, you know, because this is, you know, school. We could all talk about, you know, like, what were the educational requirements that helped me get my job, special training, yada, yada, yada. I mean, we could also go down to who is this old man who's talking to me? Why am I here? Did he really just say his name was Ocean? You know, why does it look like he's in front of a spaceship? You know, and all those good things. So make let me know that you're all alive and know that the chat works. And give me a number one if you're awake and you have coffee in your hand. <laughs> No coffee, but I'm here. All right, all right. <laughs> Fair enough. There we go. We got a one in the chat. Fair enough. If, <laughs> it should also be noted, I've been a radio DJ for years, and now I'm a live stream DJ. So it's kind of become a thing. Heck yeah, coffee at 3 p.m. Come on now. And I'll, I'll take tea. tea. Tea's a good caffeinated uh, beverage, you know, such is life. So in the chat, everyone, what questions do you have right now that you would love to to be answered? What, what would you like to know of me? Ooh, Coca-Cola. I guess I could work as well. <laughs> Don, I miss your giggle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have Coke or coffee because I'm on a caffeine-free diet. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> I'm just sorry, man. That is my last vice. I, it's the only thing I can't get rid of. <laughs> oh. Well, while you're all thinking of things to ask, maybe I can go back up into here. I will also want you to know one thing before I get dive too deep into anything. And that is that this connection, this, this big old bobcat, mm -hmm. is a calling card and it can get you indoors. Your network, like stay in contact with your cohort for sure but drop the bobcat card wherever you go and i'm not one that usually wears the bobcat on my sleeve it's i'm a townie it's kind of a thing you don't necessarily showcase it off but it has gotten me in more doors it has taken me literally across the world a couple of times because of opportunities because i went to the school and it may not have been because of the network i built then but it was someone else that said oh hey you'd be a great fit for this. Or, hey, welcome into the community. Let me take you out to dinner. You know, let me show you around the town. And it, something that should also be noted about the Bobcat is I can also call out a Bobcatter probably from a million miles when I look at a page layout, no matter how different and wild you think you are. <laughs> I'm sorry, I could see it a million miles away because of the foundations that have been set here. And it's great. <laughs> I always say go around, like get on LinkedIn. I'm like, yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I digress. Or who's the creative director that's un above this person? <laughs> so what sort of questions we have here? Uh... Yeah, we've got a couple. Do you want me to read them to you? Yeah, please. That'd be awesome. Okay, so the first one said, uh, where is the overlap between your job and your work as an artist? <laughs> um, it never wasn't an overlap. I think in every job I've done, even being a janitor, there's always been that overlap. Uh, I'll get into PBS in a moment, but I'm going to harp on this one for a second. One of my first jobs... Uh, in school was working for Ohio University cleaning the dorms after kids went away for the summer. And I got onto grout cleaning. It is the most OCD thing you can give a designer to do. Clean the grout. <laughs> Here's a toothpick, more or less, you know, toothbrush, go, go to town. <laughs> and so then when it came to Karen Knopf's class and I was cutting out, oh God, I've got it. That shape with color aid, <laughs> which is a horrible product that you can't touch with your naked fingers because of the oils, delicately cutting it out. It was the years of OCD clean grout that I was like, oh, I just take my time. I keep doing it. Cut, cut, cut. And I'll get a nice clean line in the end. It's not just one cut and done. Yeah, that's a good way to hurt the grout. Same with color aid. Now, 
I hope you guys don't have to do that. But if you ever find yourself with an exacto in your hand, slow and steady wins the brace. As for PBS, <laughs> that one was purely dumb luck. We needed, oh man, can I slide to that photo? <laughs> I might be able to get there. Um, let's see if I share screen again. Uh, OU card. That's going to get me every time. So when I got hired for working at PBS Kids, this was the PBS Kids Go website. It was all Flash. It, I was a Flash coder at the time and designer, and I guess they call it now dev. And this mm. video, I don't know if you can see it, my mouse swinging around here, uh, the little more videos in the side where it says, we're a girl summer trip, needed to have audio behind it. But the audio from the video at that time was so atrociously compressed and it was a short loop and we couldn't, we, the loop just wouldn't stand. And so I was like, oh, I can recut that and I can load it in Flash as a separate, you know, file underneath the timeline and have it run. So it just it lines up. It looks beautiful. And that was when PBS was alerted to the fact that I knew a damn thing about audio. Um, <laughs> And then it turns out that I've now DJed two of my cohort's weddings. Uh, <laughs> I've done sound. Uh, I made a sound booth out of a abandoned office, a sleeping bag and a microphone. You know, it, it, you get resourceful when, you know, you're working for PBS and they have no money, but they need something to be done. Uh, we also made these really nifty motion activated bands that was kind of like Simon Says. And so it would interlink with an app and we needed audio at the time. And I think this was the, the big trigger for them was they were like, oh, we just need these short loops to happen. I'm like, oh, I, I do that for fun. That That's what I, I produce music. I could do that. And I always just kept saying yes. And that's how this part of my you know, musical love became a part of my job and became a part of my job title. So I hope that answered the question. What else we got? Yeah, we've got another one. Uh, what would you be doing if your current career didn't exist? <laughs> um, I would still, if my current career didn't exist, well, then that would mean that the internet didn't exist. Um, probably rock climbing, if you know, or <laughs> teaching, you know, being a forest ranger, you know, admittedly. Uh, I tried doing that in my 20s slash 30s. I almost made it there. You know, I made it to the AM circuit, but didn't quite get sponsored. So... Uh, yeah, van life is a, a, a real thing on a side note. Uh, and if you think it's a new thing, um, yeah, no, it's ah. not. Uh, I spent <laughs> some of the formative years, those are my parents and their dog, uh, in a van. So ah, ah, <laughs> just going to say, <laughs> it would be an updated version of that. <laughs> All right, what else you guys got? Come on. Were you in Boston, though, at one I, point? I've not been to Boston uh, professionally, uh, but my uncle lives there, so I've definitely spent a, a great amount of time there. Okay. <laughs> what is your best advice? We've got one more. Best advice to beginning grad art students? Oh, best advice. Um, when it's all done, when you've graduated, Defer your loan for a year and go do something for yourself. It will be the last time as an adult that you can do that. And I always thought it was insanely frivolous. I thought it was absolute BS that people would go and backpack across Europe or like go cross country and all this stuff. Go walk the Appalachian Trail. I'm staring down the barrel at 50 and I wish I had done that. I wish I had done all those things. I, I one day will walk the Appalachian Trail. One day I will jump on my bike 
and do the Leadville 100 in Colorado and put my body through absolute torment and tour on a mountain bike. Um, you know, I'll go snowboarding and rock climbing in Canada, Western Canada, that is. Yeah. And I, I, those are the things like, that's what I would say to do as a knee jerk, as a, as a life thing. Um, the other thing to do is never stop networking. Like it's, it's all about who, you know, I mean, my first job out of school was to move to Switzerland to work for the UN. Who, who, who does that? I did that <laughs> because I saw a flyer in the Siegfried hallway that said, so you want to go to Switzerland? <laughs> and I said, Sweden, that's really cool. <laughs> um, but, you know, a bunch of Franciscan monks needed a web designer. I ended up there. <laughs> go fig. It was the best year of snowboarding and working to advocate for the rights of human trafficked peoples I, th I think I've ever done. You know, it was very enlightening for sure. And I'm definitely not religious. <laughs> I'm Taoist, and that was one of their big questions. <laughs> so what else we got? We have a few more coming in. Um, what shifts have you had to make in your work due to the pandemic, and were there any good ones? You know what? There were. There, actually, there are lots of amazing shifts that happened. A, um, my food intake has become amazing. Uh, I'm eating all organic, all my own made food. Uh, not grown, but I belong to a local CSA, um, community supported agriculture. Um, I bike, I, I lost my commute. So now I'm biking every which way. I, I already was a bike commuter, but now I'm biking for fun. Um, meditation, I, I now have a standing desk. And, you know, just more free time. You know, it's like all those times that could be taken in transport. That and also video conferencing is amazing when everyone's on it. When you're the only one on the video conference, it was such a pain. And now mm -hmm. that everyone has experienced it, I hope yeah. that there's a little bit more like, oh, the individual that's on the in the box, we should pay attention to them as well. So, I mean, those things were definitely beneficial. Um, there wasn't very many hardships work-wise because I already live stream. I'm a live stream DJ. I do it on Twitch. I've done it on YouTube now for... A couple of years I do internet radio so all this rig was already here I mean this was already set up the lights the whole nine and so I just went in raided the studio grabbed some extra gear and poof my studio became even more elaborate <laughs> so <laughs> it's rather hard to do design work here at times because you do get distracted but on the other hand I've made some amazing playlists <laughs> <laughs> We what had kind else? of a follow up to that that first question. Um, yeah, go for it. Just asking, is it is it possible to work for a media location remotely, or is it really better to be actually there in person? <sighs> That's a really good question, and I think, as someone new, if you are a new hire, if you are new to the team, if you are young in your career. You want to be in the thick of it. You want to be there. You want to have those hip checks. Um, I actually had to fight to make our office into a bullpen so that we could all our monitors faced inward so that at any given moment you could turn around and look at someone else's stuff and give feedback and not like critical heavy feedback, just like that. Hey, you know, are you sure you're not in CMYK by accident because that green looks a little off from here? You know, that sort of, those sort of hip checks, those things that save you time so quickly. Um, and those are the sort of things that I think I miss uh, for all my reportees and the people underneath me. Um, I miss that sort of interaction. As someone who's been there now for at PBS for 12 years, I want to move further away. Like, I, I'm like, hey, cool. Like, I mean, I can do this from Vermont or Colorado or, you know, insert other town with ski resort, 
you know, and it works. Sweet. Um, but I think that really does come at the the downfall of the young members on our team. And I think that'll be an interesting paradox that we will see play out in the coming months and years uh, with COVID. Sorry, that was a bit of a Debbie Downer. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had a question about that picture you had just uh, thrown up there. The, huh? What did the Mugwump Studio produce? So they were traveling photographers, freelance photographers for National Geographic, uh, Geo Magazine, uh, Library of Congress, uh, to name a few. And then later on with the, I don't know if the word guidance would be the right word, but the poll of my grandfather, Chuck Scott, Terry Eiler and Chuck Scott started the School of Visual Communications, which used to be right underneath uh, the School of Graphic Design in the Siegfried Building, which I don't think you guys are no longer like stacked on top of one another anymore. I think they're all the new, um, what used to be Baker. I've now forgotten the new name. Anyway. Schoenhofer or Schoenhofer. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so they started the school at Ohio University and the rest is history. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, we've got somebody wondering if you can talk about your design process. How does your design process vary from project to project? And um, they said it, it really looks like you were a maker. De definitely on the lines of maker. Um, our design process is crazy. Um, so if we're looking at a life cycle of a project at PBS, I mean, we've got a bunch of players uh, that are involved in it. So PBS is a clearinghouse. So we hold all these things, but we don't necessarily create them. Sometimes we do, um, but we mainly create the wrappers for everything. So we have a producer. Here is Mr. Cat with a nice top hat. Might be a bowler hat, but I'll, I'll let it slide at the moment. And uh, he comes up with a sweet idea. All right. So he goes and he talks to our content team. And he goes, hey, we've got this sweet idea. What do you think about it? That sweet idea gets sent over to the design team. We take a crack at it. We give some feedback. And we pitch it back to the producer. Producer will, you know, take a gander at it. Sometimes they'll take the feedback. Sometimes they'll revoke it. But generally, they take it, and then they have to go find a vendor. Now, th their vendor is because generally these producers don't have a large enough team yet. They're not a Sesame Street um, to have in-house web, in-house animation, in-house graphics. And so they'll go find a firm to do that work for them. So then we move into, you know, we've now got the idea out. They've come back. They've rounded out the proposal. They send it back to the content team. The content team gives a good chuckle and we take it to testing. And kids are, they don't pull punches. They <laughs> are not politically correct. They don't care about feelings. One of, <sighs> I got hired to build a video player. My third week on the job, I'd quickly mocked up a video player, took it into testing behind like the the mirrored window you know which is a, a weird situation to be behind i'm standing there i've got my computer typing and I'm, I'm listening to the feedback and the kid goes man this sucks <laughs> and it was like i just been hired i've got <laughs> everyone that hired me right behind me <laughs> you want to talk about just sweating bullets as i'm recoding and redesigning the site to push before the next kid to take his feedback and my boss very quickly before I pushed it live said, no, we need to hear all this feedback because mm. all this feedback lets us know. And it's also not just your fault because I let it go that far. And so I'm like, all right, cool. This is a team. We are a team. We're building these things. So anyway, kids give brutal feedback. <laughs> Lesson <laughs> learned. And we give brutal feedback as well. <laughs> And the devs, if you think our feedback is horrible, man, just wait till a developer gets a hold of your idea and or your code base and they'll tear it apart. 
<laughs> so now it gets sent back to the producer and the developer. So now we're out of the alpha phase and now we're into beta. So it, it it's a bit of a, a three step process and I bet you can kind of guess where this is going, right? So we go into the content, we go to user testing, we get kids doing adorable things like flapping their wings with video uh, motion sensitive <laughs> cameras. <laughs> It's trying to get that bat to flap through the window and hopefully he'll get all tired out and be ready for a nap. <laughs> you know, it was, maybe that's what the, the parent in me is saying. So after we've done that, you know, if we get another hack at it, the devs get another hack at it. They get to fix all the things we've found. And then comes the final. And then goes the content, goes to the devs. We all take one final, oh my goodness, let's get it out there. And then we launch it. It is, th and the reason why I illustrate this and I run through the whole process is because I've not seen another shop be this intense on building something out. And we burn through firms because they don't understand what they're getting into. Because like, yeah, they've got their designers, they've got their egos, they've got their stuff, but then we have us. And our designers and our feedback and our specialty is kids and design. And we've had a couple coming to Jesus talks over the years, I'm sure. But <laughs> in the end, it's all, I mean, it's all for the kids. And so it makes amazing products. Sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get it there. But man, like our stuff wins awards. I mean, right now, our website, our eight-year-old website, just won another Webby Award. Mm. how often does that happen and how often mm. have we back to back won that webby award a good couple times um and it's because we put that much thought in, into it and we've iterated upon it once we've like found issues with it we fix it and i mean we're about to tear it apart and rebuild it all over again i wish i had things i could show you that we're going through like we just did a color exploration with usability in mind so it was like every colorblind test you could throw at it using our color our standard color palette and then trying to find one that works on the web that also can we can find something that's close to for print you know a moderate match that is then also safe for usability it was a nightmare and then it's like okay cool like we've got a very limited color palette uh six colors mainly uh but we also have to illustrate within that palette and so it's like okay what would a brown look like within this color palette oh we have to we have to make caveats for that within our style guide it's like okay here's our main color palette here's our sub color palette and here's the illustration color palette and then what, what about the, the print color palette? <laughs> All right. it, it, it's a tangent and it's a huge Figma spreadsheet of crazy sauce. Uh, and I'm so excited about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so what else we got? What else we got? Well, as you're, so as you're making, you know, sites and stuff like this, how do you get into the mindset of a kid? Um, is it natural to you or are you doing a lot of research to get there? Both. Um, so a, a quote that I actually left out of this, I really wish I had put in. Uh, my father from a very early age told me I never have to grow up. I just have to get my work done. <laughs> he also told me whoever dives with the most toys wins, but that's for another story. Um, and so I think I kind of have the mindset of a 13 year old constantly <laughs> but then user testing and staying abreast of what these kids are and where they are i mean not only technologically but just mentally i mean it's that that check-in i mean having a kid definitely puts you in that mindset but even before i had the kid uh who she's six now um i was going into user testing and just trying to figure out what their ethos were where they were absorbing their media and it's 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 a, it's something for sure especially when you get new people that first come in and they're not initiated yet it's like oh yeah you need to go to user testing 
just go sit down and mm-hmm. get ready because it's going to be a ride. Um, so that's <laughs> really the best answer I've got on that one. Yeah, sure. We've got another one. Um, yeah. Is there a standards manual on the characters? And I'm going to oh. add this, but can we see it? <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. But yeah, for each uh, <laughs> producer asset, you know, Sesame Street, I'm, I'm looking here, we've got Arthur, we've got Dinosaur Chain, Ready, Jet, Go, Wild Cries. Each one has their own style guide. Each one has their own nuances that they have. And each one comically blends pretty well with our current color palette because our current color palette has been the same color palette for almost 20 years now. Mm. And so a part of our job is also knowing that style guide inside and out. Um, I think the one that is probably the most stringent is Pinkalicious. Uh, it was a new person on the scene and man, there are so many rules that I, I've got little sticky notes on like each one. It's not the things I need to pay attention to. It's all the things I normally would do and forget. And so it's like, okay, note to self, I can only crop her at certain points. You know, I can't, put her too close to her brother you know she can only be wearing certain outfits make sure that her pigtails are always up you know there's all sorts of things that you need to be wary of for each property and that's that's my jam like i love making feature graphics those are the things that i could do for hours that weird almost mindless pixel pushing where you put on some really fast-paced music and you zone out and you try to be their artist you know, as a designer, you are someone else's hands. Um, and I think that's something that I, I really try to embody no matter which, whatever property I'm taking on or doing freelance work. You know, I have to combine and meld all the ideas that someone else has in their own head and stuff it into mine and mm-hmm. then use the years of training to make something awesome for them. So there you go. What else we got? I think we've got somebody um, who wanted to ask a question. Did I see? Yeah, I see a hand. Yeah. Up, you're muted. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, okay. That explains it. Um, (laughs) I was wondering, um, do y'all typically have like a pool of, say, like character designers, graphic artists, that kind of thing that, you know, they will have to change and adapt the way they work depending on the show or does like each show have their own like employee base and are those like housed inside the studio or are they often like hired out it really depends on how big the property is so for a place like sesame street it that's like walking into a a small university they've got everyone there um you take a property like uh god let's think about this uh wild they farm out uh, so that would be, I think, Tumu's does most of their work. Uh, they're based in Australia. Um, and that goes back to that vendor in that, that whole diagram. You know, So it's like you'll have character artists, you'll have graphic designers, web designers, devs, the whole nine. They get farmed out. And they, it may not be one company. It may be like six companies that make one show that then all gets funneled to us. So it's kind of a riot. Is it challenging to like be able to assimilate all of these different styles in the work that you do? Yes and no. Uh, I think what it's definitely done is kept it interesting where the monotony doesn't exist um, because there will always be something new. Um, and it's not just it. for me, it's also programming wise or whatever tool I'm using. I, I love to be abreast of the latest and greatest and be experimenting. Um, And the same goes with the artwork is that I've got my bullet journal and I open it up. Who am I going to be? Who am I going to be working with today? You know, what is it going to be? You know, so it's what's kept me there for so long. Well, thank you. No worries. No worries. We had uh, somebody asking about what software you use for your animations. For the animations? 
Mm -hmm. Um, God, that's a variety of softwares at the moment. Um, so we were a big flash house for a hot second. Well, actually for a long time. And then the iPhone came along and crippled all of that. Uh, thank you, Steve jobs, rest in peace. Um, but you know, so then animate still pushes out in a variety of different formats. Uh, SVG is another one that we tend to push out in. I'm trying to think of the others. And this is where I wish I had Ivy on the, on the phone. He would just drill you down on everything after effects, especially, uh, we use actually a lot of after effects come to think of it. So. And After Effects now exports out uh, into HTML friendly formats. So <laughs> making web stuff beautiful again. You know, when we went to CSS, it was like going back in time. You know, we lost Flash, we went back into time and people don't understand how good we had it for the hot second. I mean, yeah, the it was a huge data hog. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, but we're just now getting back to like the mid 2000s as far as beautiful web design. What else we got, guys? Hey, what gals. About, um, audio, what do you guys use for that? Um, really anything that moves. Uh, so I will use, let's see, Audition, I'll use Pro Tools, I'll use Ableton Live, I use Serato DJ. Um, comically, uh, and Rekordbox DJ. I'm using a variety of different plugins that are out there, Audacity. Uh, if it has the right tool set, I will use it. Uh, I haven't used FLC Studio or FL Studios, and that's just because I haven't had access to it yet. Uh, I've used Cubase for ages now. Um, I've got a really old cracked version of Fruity Loops. So like I said, if it will make sounds, I'll use it. Ooh, what else we got? Da, 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 da. Got a couple more. Um, would you like to see cartoons revert back to the hand drawn? Or do you embrace the digital only cartoon style? <laughs> uh, I will take <laughs> any style that kids want to make in. I, I think that there's, I mean, as someone who's standing in front of a huge wall of records, like I love me some analog, don't get me wrong, but I did analog. I love my digital. Um, it is, it doesn't break my back. I can undo things move so much faster. Um, <laughs> it's like I went to school at OU and I got two degrees back in the day, one was interactive multimedia from Fizcom and the other one was graphic design. That's because at the time, you know, the graphic design program didn't have the interactive part aspect to it yet, but no one did at that point. It had to be two degrees. There was no such thing necessarily as web design or a web designer. It became a thing as I was graduating. Um, and it definitely wasn't something you necessarily went to school for. You collected all your assets and then you, you ran off and you tried to become one. And so, yeah, no, I, if I can, I'll always latest and greatest. <laughs> one more question, kind of going back to that uh, the software one we had earlier. Did um, losing Flash do a number on your archive? You know what? Losing cork did a number on my archive. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to go back and pull things for this presentation to show my old work. A, I don't have the dongle anymore. I just Mary Kondoed my cork dongle and my uh, all my discs for all my old programs. I still have my original iMac with cork loaded on it. It won't take my zip disk anymore. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. we can go down the line. No, I still have Flash loaded up. It still plays just fine. Uh, it reads all my stuff. What really did me in actually is the change in resolution sizes. So a 300 by 300 graphic used to be massive. Mm -hmm. I could print them and they would look beautiful. In fact, you, hold on. So back in the day, I, this is a horrible example because you're on a GoPro and you're looking at glossy. 
but this is printed <laughs> in our lab. It looks beautiful. There's no pixel. Oh, there's a little pixelization around the edge, but you'd have to really be looking for it now. Mm -hmm. It was 300 by 300 pixels, right? If I went out and used an Epson printer now, just standard desktop Epson printer, and printed out the same file, which I still have, it would look like rubbish because mm. it's so much better now. The quality is so much better. And so print and update your archives. Oh my goodness. Like I've, yeah, I've lost more or less all that stuff if I haven't printed it. And I mean, and some of it is like good riddance. I mean, Don, I love you. I was so wildly <laughs> entitled and had my head stuck up my own ass. I thank you for dealing with me for all those years. I look back at my stuff and I'm like, how did you guys not kick me to the curb and tell me to go home? Um, <laughs> I was looking at our currency project and I was like, wow, okay, fair enough. Yeah. But, I was, but I'm also looking at it and going, okay, I was influenced by Ray Gun Magazine, Wired Magazine. Wired Magazine was still hot back then. It wasn't the, the old boomer magazine that it is now. You know, like Spin Magazine and like stuff like that. And like zines that were coming out of the UK. And it was all spread throughout my work. And it's like, oh, wow, like the influences and the lines are so sharp. I hadn't yet learned how to filter it out and to make it my own yet. And it, it's some of it's not pretty. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, another question just came in. Do you ever work on the game design for PBS Kids or are you strictly part of just the website design? No, I did a lot of game design, game development. Uh, the most recent project that we actually just put to bed uh, was Kirk Kingdom. And Kirk Kingdom was a kind of like my first MMO for uh, gamers. Let's see if we can slide to that screen. It'll be in here somewhere. Um, but its real big concept was that every week we would update it. And so we were constantly updating graphic sheets, spreadsheets, archives. There we go. Um, and we had this amazing, robust, very full three world sort of place that you could race, you could friend, you could craft, you could go on a platform or adventure. And, you know, walking around in this really lush, you know, environment. But then we had to make these things. And so it was a weekly chore to make new carts for the kingdom, you know, or new hairstyles for the kingdom or new, you know, insert whatever it may be. And on top of that, we ran a blog. Um, it was a f first for PBS Kids uh, where kids could actually write in and get responses. And that was a, a game changing and a learning curve for us, to say the least. And I think that's the thing I miss most. I, I miss that daily grind of like, okay, what am I going to, what am I going to do today? I mean, like we got, uh, I don't know why I'm mixing aid. We got a purple giraffe here, some Dalmatians, <laughs> this adorable penguin, you know, <laughs> it is what it is, but it, it allows me to like come into my job and have the harebrained idea that, Hey, we're going to make a floor puzzle and like, let's, Let's make that. Let's make it a thing. So I'm going to get on a dry erase board and I'm going to take apart all the different parts of our kingdom and put it into one big map because no one has seen that yet. It doesn't exist except <laughs> in my own mind. So let's make it, you know, and like, let's make sure that all the different areas are represented and some areas that we're going to come up and some areas that don't exist at all. I mean, I've got a, a DJ sound system dub party happening in the middle of it. <laughs> like, it's kind wow. of what it is. Anyway, I hope that answers. Huh. Yeah, we've got another one um, here that just asks, uh, what format do you recommend us to use now to think of the future? Whatever format you're comfortable with. Uh, it really, and you actually need to be as fluid with your tools as you can be. I mean, I so much of my artwork is still hand cut. You, you, I was a stencil 
art at graffiti artist for years. Uh, <laughs> to, to my parents' chagrin, but it shows up in all my work, and it doesn't matter what program I use, I'm still using that style. And so find it. Find, yeah, go for it. Oh, sorry. We had another question actually just come in about some of your personal work. So could yeah. you show us some more? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I can roll down right through it. No, let's start with, I'll throw you in the Wayback Machine. Um, so yeah, there was that first piece I did that I was talking about. That's how big it shows up. That's 300 by 300 pixels. It was massive back in the day. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't. It was probably on an 800 by 600 screen, but it was still big. I forget what this one. I think this one was about electronic music at the time. Um, but again, like I see all the the ray gun and early Shepard Fairy work, you know, being influenced in here. Uh, there's that currency project I was talking about that just I'm quietly <laughs> ashamed of. I mean, red, white, and blue. Really, really, past <laughs> ocean. Bad, bad past ocean. Um, I've also worked for the Kennedy Museum of Art, which actually later on helped me get a job at the museum here in Washington, D.C., uh, because I knew an ancient coding language called Lingo, which was a part of Macromedia's director. So I could make interactive museum exhibits. So you'd come into here, you'd click on a button, and before VR was really a thing, it was just kind of a, a fun thing that was a part of a long man movie. Yep, the one in DC. You could cycle by clicking left and right and rotate 360 degrees within this museum exhibit, which I tried to mimic as close to it as I could. Um, my senior project was building a website and it was all based around electronic dance music. Uh, I've been a DJ, a rave promoter, uh, you know, a box boy carrying speakers for years. And I wanted to document and showcase that. And each different page had a different theme and a feel with a weird peekaboo navigation because I thought I was cheeky. Oh my God. Watch me be quietly embarrassed. But <laughs> that was an HTML. I can still open it up, <laughs> unlike Flash. But what's funny about that is that website landed me the job in Switzerland because of this. This is a sitemap for that website. Mm. And the person who was hiring me said, oh, I understand the website now. Do you think you could do that for my site? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. I didn't know he had a 2,000 page PHP website. <laughs> Luckily enough, I was able to group some things together and make it not so big. He had a lot of bulk and multiple old websites just stacked on top of one another. But I was able to map it out for them to show them what they had to then build them a new one. And it's kind of wild that, you know, although I put up my heart and soul into that, it was that that got me the job. Anyway. <laughs> When I came back from Switzerland, I started a underground art and dance movement called, uh, let's see, well, that one was called No Joke. I think it was on April Fool's, but it was called Art Versus Sound. And we would pit artists against DJs. And so the DJ would have to come up, you know, to play whatever they wanted to for the crowd. And you'd have an artist on stage making art to that, whatever that might have been. It might have been interpretive dance. It might have been painting. It might have been you know, whatever. I think once we had a glass blower. Um, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Happened on the west side of Athens. Weird stuff happens there. Um, and then here are my flyers from, you know, other events I did with Headroom. And so goes back to that, do what you love and do it often and make it your side hustle because eventually your side hustle can become something that's real. You know, man, these are all so 90s. I love it. <laughs> so my last piece with the Kennedy Museum, it was a mobile museum. So it was something that they could send around to schools and it needed branding. It was just something that they could slap on the labels, slap on the insides. Super simple, but had to, had to work its way around it. And I have all my original sketchbooks, so I have all the horrible ideas I had beforehand before I got to that one. 
I also got, before DC, I got a short stint with uh, Duncan Yo-Yos doing the inside of their yo-yos for their professional yo-yo team because that's a thing. And man, when someone says like, oh man, I saw your yo-yos in Singapore. <laughs> I got to laugh because like, I'm still trying to buy all of them. I don't have a full collection. I'm slowly <laughs> getting them. <laughs> that's another thing. If you ever do work for someone else, make sure they send you product, your product, because you're going to want it. Yeah. Uh, actually, this was coming from Switzerland. This was my first uh, printed piece I actually did for them. It was just a cover for their Human Rights Handbook. And I mean, you see all my graffiti influences all spread throughout it. And those monks were all about it. <laughs> Say what you will, like monks have it going on. Um, <laughs> when I came to DC, I came to DC because of a bunch of OU grads were starting a startup called Pixels and Ink, and they wanted to make promo postcards, weird abstract postcards. They would just have like the name of their company on the back. You'd find them in bars and whatnot. And so they had me do a series of them, you know, from just photos and whatnot that I've taken over my travels. And then sometimes I'd put text on it. Sometimes I wouldn't, well, I guess I only put two of those in there, but we had a whole series of them. It's funny because every once in a while, I, I still find a few floating around and just give me a chuckle. That must've been fun. Oh, it was, it, it was the best part of that about that job. I mean, at that point I was full interactive. I was doing a little bit of videography for pixels and ink and, um, a lot of it was real estate stuff. And so it was pretty monotonous work, but with huge budgets. I mean, say what you will about real estate. It's boring, but man, they've got budgets and they want the most flashiest X, Y, Z and you, you give it to them and it's a lot of fun to do it. Uh, I then took the flip of that. I went to a place that had all the money in the world and it was the most soul sucking job on the planet. Not every firm is the best. <laughs> To give context for it, in 2004 dollars, I think we're looking at 80, 88,000 a year to do Photoshop comps. Like, <laughs> stupid money. Did I buy a house? No. Did I put it into a 401k? No. Did I do any of that? No. I bought a really fast car. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it also allowed me to to really get into rock climbing and try my hand at being an amateur slash professional rock climber and a dirt bagger. Um, so, you know, it, it allowed for things. Mm. And then PBS kids happened. And that was when my flat graffiti style really came into play because all of a sudden I couldn't use shadows like shadows, like these shadows here along the sides, were the only mandated allowed shadows on the whole of the website. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to fight tooth and nail to get that. <laughs> and now looking back on it, I probably could have done without them. But anyway, I digress. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it was to build a video player. And the reason I got this was because I could do video green screen work and I was a flash coder, you know? And so that's how I got in the door. <laughs> and the only reason I knew how to do green screen work is because they asked, could you do green screen work? I said, yes. And before my next interview, I learned everything about doing green screens and even painted a section of the wall to learn how to key out video. So <laughs> then I could speak to it even with more authority. They actually didn't need that at all. They just threw it in there for giggles. Still mm -hmm. burns me to this day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, here, here was my domain for years uh, was this website. And this was like, so when you're in this website, if you clicked all the way back here, we had a whole hidden game section. It was called Times Square. And you'd kind of like zoom like the matrix as if like all the, you know, the guns were coming at you via Neo into this room and you just have this wall of games. And it was like three stories of games. And then we even had a subterranean level if you knew how to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the iPhone came out and I had to figure out how to, make that into HTML and still uh, make it fun and still uh, not make it parent like, you know, and, and usable. Cause now all of a sudden, instead of 
kids clicking and finding, they were becoming more savvy users because they weren't using a mouse. They were using their fingers. All of a sudden, the scroll or the below the fold wasn't a thing anymore because they weren't dealing with the scroll wheel. They could swipe up and down. It was like all of a sudden the game changed and we went and did a user testing thing. And it was like everything I had as concrete, kids are like this. Nope, nope, moving target. Which, you know, every year I, I'll go and do user testing as much as I can. Yep. On a side note, do I miss Mr. Rogers? Yes, <laughs> I really do. I never had the opportunity to meet him, um, but from everyone who has been touched by his presence, yeah. and I say touched, it, it it's literally like people talk about it and the reverency that they have for the man is insane. Um, yeah. And... You know, in that regard, he was just before my time, but yeah. his impact in legacy is just incredible. So Daniel Tiger is uh, is kind of the replacement then. Yeah, it is. I mean, for lack of a better word, it is the the second coming, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he really embodies it all, and that's yeah. been half the fun mm-hmm. of uh, being that is that you get to kind of relive it and simplify it down and then bring it to a whole another generation, you know, with all the things that are current, you know? Mm. So the red lion, which has been uh, my moniker uh, as my DJ, uh, I'm known as a librarian. And this was a really rough sketch that happened in an all staff meeting. And it took me a year to kind of like, I kept picking it up, putting it down, picking it up, putting it down, finally bashed it out, then turned around and licensed it to a record called Elm Imprint, which I then later on did their logo for. And Elm Imprint uh, is an American drum and bass label that is really trying to push a an analog and digital branch of their music. And so... Elm Imprint was originally supposed to be just their vinyl releases. Mm -hmm. And so as they added more people onto their roster, you know, we've got Raw, R-A-W, or C-Block out of California. He came to me with, uh, proposed, he wanted this like skull wearing glasses with the flipped up like uh, Brooklyn style biker hat. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do that. You know, he really wanted to have this day of the dead look and feel and he had a he had a pretty flat tattoo idea and i was like nah well let's let's bump this out let's give it a little bit of 3d in depth uh i've now made a couple different variants of this one but Mm. it's a fun graphic uh this one i did later on for them was just a bandana because hey why not for merch Mm. Mm. but from that merch i got the deal with adventure geek uh, who had picked up their merch at a local rave and they asked who the artist was. And so then all of a sudden I'm now doing bike kit for Adventure Geek and their crazy like kayaking and mountain biking and trail running races, which then goes back to PBS Kids. So we have this possibility to do VR for the anniversary of the lunar landing mission. Mm. And so it's like, okay, cool. We need to make a mock-up. Who knows how to use an airbrush? Uh, This guy. And so, let's see. Yeah, exactly. Waving hands in the back. Uh, I think I've undone that. (laughs) So I started with this mock-up. I made one. It was all right. Cool. All right. That works. Then we had to figure out how the decal was going to work on it. And we got a different base and we got some feedback on how rough and dirty it needed to look. And then they decided to clean it all up and figured that people would just get it dirty on, on their own. And we cleaned it up even more and there's a the finished product. Mm. Now, mind you, I've, I've made four of these. I've got one at the office and I've got another one somewhere floating around here. But that mm. was a, a physical product that, again, 
makes my job exciting because I never know what I'm going to get asked to do on a, a daily basis. <laughs> it was also the first time I got to work from home. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a week to make it, and then they gave me two weeks to make the other two. So there you go. So there's a quick down memory lane. I'm sure I skipped a handful of others. I didn't get into any of the Foley work I, I do, but ah. wow. there's my graphic work for you. What other questions you got? Have you um, ever ended up doing much VR or AR work, or has it mostly been just web stuff that you tend to stick to? So at the moment, it's web stuff. Um, I've helped on the outskirts, and I've definitely researched a lot of AR and VR. When it was really making its, I should say, third historic push out the door, one of the big things that came out for PBS Kids is the age at which VR is developmentally appropriate for children's minds. Um, and so I think it's around 13 is the appropriate age limit because by that point they have a firm grasp of reality. And if you throw a kid into a AR, VR, immersive setup too soon, their grasp on reality is strained, if not broken or can be. And that's a fear. And so PBS Kids definitely stepped away from that pretty quickly. We left it more for the GA, the general audience side, to champion and do that sort of work. But every once in a while, we get pulled into their projects and they get pulled into ours. Mm. What else we got? This is Darren Baker. I loved hearing about the that time period in the late 90s, whenever, uh, you know, because I was an undergrad in the late 90s, right around 2000, when everybody was going to flash and there was like this uh, wave of excitement that was happening. There was all kinds of all new stuff happening all the time, all over the place. And of course, all of it was, you know, being inspired by Neville Brody and David Carson and all of that sort of stuff. And so it was like everybody was reworking everything at that point. But there was always this sort of like new thing happening all the time. And um, uh, and then, you know, uh, CSS happened and it seemed like it was like day and night slam on the brakes, mm -hmm. you know, and and I, I guess it's something that I've always thought. And I remember I was there. Um, and and uh, you know, and seeing oh well, now we have to go redo everything in this kind of really horrible format and um, clunky clunky format, yeah. Oh, it was horrible, and you know because you know I my our website I used to work for a design company, Cram Design, and we won a Webby once before you know back in Flash days and. You know, and I mean, they were like crazy with curtains opening and all kinds of like crazy stuff that you could never do and see it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and anyway. And, you know, so what where is that life now? You know, it's what slowly are... coming back. I, I see it more and more as it, it's not as robust. But what's interesting is it's more user centric and it's all the small old original flash tricks from back in the day. And we're starting to come back in CSS and SVG. And it's like, okay, we're finally, the coding languages between Pixie, between JavaScript um, are, are finally getting there. We're finally able to replicate what we could do without the bloat, without the security holes. Um, are yeah. they as easy and immersive to build? Is it happening as rapid fire as it was back in the day no right but you know what it's getting there yeah you know because it's so it, it was for the longest time there was this debate of uh you know as a graphic designer you're a print designer or a web designer or there were some people that would bridge both of those things you know mm -hmm. then there then there when you know all of the css started happening all these like weird little names started coming out about that were kind of designers, but not really designers. And, you know, all of these really strange little fields started coming out. Um, uh, and, it, and it seemed like there was a lot of specialty that mm -hmm. happened at that point. Which you know? actually brings a really solid point. 
Never specialize. Always be a jack of all trades. Never be a master of one. The moment you're a master of one, you are expendable. And it almost happened to me at PBS Kids. And actually, audio was one of the things that saved my bacon. But I was their flash guy. That's what I did. Uh, I was their flash designer. I had a flash at that point in time. We were doing so much work. I had a flash developer that only did flash coding. I mean, just said how knee deep we were in it. And it was overnight. Now, mind you, we also had enough legacy stuff that we had a 10 year window as it was closing out that we had to fold all that stuff and still maintain all that stuff. So I, I did have a nice little parachute to handle as I, you know, tried to figure out what direction I was going to go into. But the the one thing I will say as a caveat to all that is that no matter what kind of designer you are, you're still a designer. The more I get, in, the deeper I get into it, it's all about your color choice, your eye flow, you know, your hierarchy. And it's like if I, I have a checklist, more or less, that I run down through when I'm giving feedback is like, has it ticked these boxes yet? If not, just take it away. Like it's like, no, nope, it's not there yet. And you know, the, the people that report to me either love me or hate me for it. But I was like, OK, you know, have you done these things? Is, is it has each and every little tiny graphic that you've created have that flow and then within its own graphic, but then also what does it look like within the whole page? You know, because you could be so microcosmed into just that and it meant look 100 percent nailed it. And then you throw it into a page and it completely gets lost and you're like, OK, nope, doesn't work. Fair enough. And now we're working with things like dynamic graphics where, you know, you give it the Photoshop file and it's calling on the Photoshop file and exporting out what it needs to be in the size it needs to be right from the file. So it's like now it's now it's got to be not only good there, but it's got to be good in six different variants. <laughs> depending on where it's going. Wild times. Have you ever uh, found yourself having to um, compromise on what you thought was the proper design based on what the needs of the client or um, you know directors were? Oh, all the time. <laughs> you know, the the client is always an idiot, but the client <laughs> pays the bills. You know, and so all you can do is guide them. If mm -hmm. you haven't been able to guide them, it's a failure on your part. You know, so go out there and work on your persuasion. Work on your oral arguments. Figure out, <laughs> work on your public speaking. But work on, and also just education. Educate them so that they don't make the mistake of going against you. Yeah. And it took me years to learn that. Years. Oh, my God. If I could kick my like past self in the teeth a couple times I would totally do it like just <laughs> you know it, a quote from my boss that I thoroughly thoroughly love um oh yeah is this one you know you always have to be open to change and you can't ever fall in love with your own stuff but with that same said design principles are design principles they don't change you know, bad color choice and bad eye flow is bad eye flow. Never show anything you don't want to use because the client will pick it every time. Every, <laughs> every time. <laughs> it's only happened to me once. I learned it early on in middle school, but I still have to look at that yearbook every year. <laughs> My daughter flips through and goes, I want to look at old photos of you. I'm like, just don't. Oh, you pick the, the pink dog book. Ugh. OK. What else we got? I think that's it for questions in the chat. Okay. I don't know if anybody else has anything. Oh, I think there was one more. Um, the jump from flash C to C++ when he mm -hmm. saw that flash is about to crush now that uh, crash now that C++ is also fading away what's next 
<laughs> great, great freaking question. You know, learn them all. <laughs> and it, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, I I learned from my father very early on. Every Christmas, we'd go on break. We'd have like a, you know the the old OU break where you'd have like three weeks. I don't think you guys still get that the, that luxury. Uh, but he had like a chunk between like Thanksgiving and Christmas. You didn't have to come back. And he would pick up a new book and learn a new coding language. And I always thought it was ridiculous. I mean, this is back in the day when like desktops were massive. And he would haul the whole thing to Indiana from Ohio, set it up in a room, and would more or less lock himself away as we were doing our like Christmas Thanksgiving revelry. And he would learn a new coding language. <laughs> I now understand why he did that every time. It was always a new language. You know, it was like either there was an update to Lingo because Lingo kept updating their language and completely revamping themselves. But what you learn from each language usually is transferable to another language. Um, the only one that didn't really work with that was uh, Action Script 1. But from Action Script 2 to 3, from original uh, lingo to JavaScript, it's all object oriented languages. Once you understand the fundamental of one, you can then turn around and apply it to whatever is the new, the latest and greatest coding language that's coming down the pike. Um, so, <laughs> there's my feedback. <laughs> Any other good questions we got? Uh, I have a quick question. Go for um, it. I really, I really like the idea of um, just jumping in and learning um, a script in three weeks, you know, mm -hmm. from, from zero uh, experience to it. Uh, is there a script you could recommend for someone who has zero experience at all with, with any of it? What, what's like a really navigatable, approachable uh, script to learn from scratch? And I'm not banking on a three week time period either. So don't don't feel like that's uh, <laughs> something I'm shooting for. But yeah, no, it's funny because I at this point I've stepped away from scripting enough that I wouldn't have. I do you know, I'd, I'd be looking at Pixie, you know, if, I, if there was something that I wanted to animate that can do beautiful things in HTML, I'd be like, go wrap your brain around Pixie and just get get onto YouTube. I mean, you guys have the internet and it is glorious and it is fabulous. It is like a grand external brain. I don't know how I lived without it, but somehow I made it through college with the slowest of slow <laughs> internet <laughs> where I could actually find the end of Google. Um, and I walked uphill both ways. It was called <laughs> Morton Hill. Um, <laughs> but I digress. Yeah, jump in and start there and then look at what's recommended for you after you've you've got a rough base. And I mean, like go out and do the old school, of like make a bouncing ball loop. Once you've got that down, you can figure out everything else. And that was usually like my my bar of, OK, can I make an animated ball bounce and make it as good as a hand rendered ball? You know, and like doing that in Flash was easy. You know, I had the timeline. It felt just like animating, old school style. When I had to do it via Giphy or GIF um, in, God, what was that? It was image ready in Photoshop. It was like the, the, the little like drop down in Photoshop where you could go in and make animated GIFs, right? <laughs> and so like I would sit there and I'd make a bouncing ball in it. And that was our assignment. And I read my <laughs> syllabus early because that was supposed to be the end. And so I made it five minute long time lapsed animation of a graffiti artist working on the psycho wall with a music track. And that's why I turned in uh, down at Viscom. And evidently they just retired the DVD that it was on because he retired. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I kind of smashed that one, but that was because I like to animate. So I got excited about that part. I really didn't care about the rest of the Photoshop class. <laughs> That's the other thing. Read your hey. syllabuses. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, Christopher, you should do some scratch films on uh, 35 millimeter film. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I have no idea what that means, but it sounds really fun. Uh, do, I, do I physically do the scratches? Is that it? Yeah, well, yep. either that 16 millimeter film is uh, fine, isn't it, uh, Ocean? Yep. And then just scratch right on the film and then run it. Even you, you can do soundtracks by scratching uh, sound on. Mm -hmm. It's so <laughs> very cool and just very art house. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, Ocean, we really appreciate you taking the time and uh, taking us down memory lane and whatever <laughs> other lane we were on. <laughs> we definitely went down a couple lanes there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of like uh, with Daniel uh, Tiger's neighborhood and uh, what is the big red dog? What's oh, Clifford, his... the big red dog. Yeah, Clifford. Yeah. <laughs> and you we know, just rebooted it too. It got a know, whole I, new <laughs> different feel. And the thing is, I'm I'm taking those to bed with me now. <laughs> I'm watching them. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's it's really calming. It's almost a zen right now for me. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, um, Sarah, is there anything else, any business we need to do at the end of this? But I think we're we're pretty much fine with that. I saw that our time is running out. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Thanks. Are you gonna uh, end with a? a a song or something? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could. I mean, there you go. Music. There you go. 